I want to thank you guys all for coming out um, tonight. We're having a presentation by a uh, student representative. Uh, he's going to tell you guys a little bit about um, car smog rules, mm -hmm. uh, what you can and can't do, um, what you can and cannot be hassled for. Um, yeah. Well, here's our student representative. How you guys doing? Good. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, um, I've met some people uh, before and also some people at the different car shows and things. Uh, I'm Kyle Millen. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Stillen. Um, Stillen, just to give you a little bit of history, we've been in business for about 28 years now. Uh, it was actually founded by my father, uh, Steve Millen, who is a professional race car driver, won world championships in IMSA, Mickey Thompson off-road racing, rally racing, different uh, types of venues and things like that. And basically, we've taken his knowledge and experience and adopted it to products that we manufacture for the street and also other uh, manufacturers' products that we resell uh, here in Costa Mesa, just down the street, uh, right next to John Wayne Airport. So, kind of to um, go over a little bit what I was hoping to talk about today is um, I've been modifying cars my entire life. I've had some that were very legal, by the book, ready to go, and others that were uh, quite across the gray area and into more of the fun lines. So you can definitely straddle the line. The key is knowing what you can and can't do, um, legally speaking. Obviously, you can do whatever you want, whatever someone will do for you. Uh, but ultimately, if you get pulled over and you start getting hassled by someone, it's good to know um, what you can say, what you can't say to uh, really make it clear uh, what is allowed on your vehicle. Uh, how many of you guys have any aftermarket parts on your car that um, would be questionable? Air intakes, superchargers, turbos, okay. Everybody has that. Yeah, exactly. So an air intake, if you have a decal on your car that's an ARB, Air Resources Board decal, it's going to have an um, EO number, an exemption order number. That basically gets you out of any issues that you might have. What that means is that company, uh, take for example a K&N or InGen, somebody like that, they worked with the state of California to ensure that that product is tested to not alter the factory uh, emissions parameters. So basically, no matter what you've done, you pop your hood, the cop says, oh, you have an intake on your car. All you have to do is point to that sticker and say, nope, I'm perfectly fine. So let me give you an example of one that we do here. If you ever have any questions on if a product is legal or not, just go to arb.ca.gov. First line right here is aftermarket parts. And if you don't know the manufacturer's name, for example, you can search in this area for the manufacturer, but say you know their exact EO number. So this is one of ours. And what this is, is this is a, an executive order uh, from the state of California that's basically saying that our intake, I think this one's intakes, yeah, it's still in cold air intake system, has been tested on various different vehicles, all these vehicles right here, to not negatively affect the emissions coming out of the car. So we have these for supercharger kits, air intake systems, um, headers, pretty much you name it. The key on this is recognizing what needs to be carb approved and what doesn't need to be carb approved. So for example, a catback exhaust, you can do whatever you want. From an emission standpoint, there's no legality on a, on a catback exhaust system. The only thing that you might have an issue with is the noise, right? So if you're Ricky Racer driving down the street full throttle, like we all like to be sometimes, uh, you might get a cop who says, oh, it's too loud or something along those lines. That's a little bit of a gray area, right? Because there's actually no law that, or no uh, test procedure that they can actually test for. It's totally subjective. So if he simply says, oh, I think your exhaust is too loud, okay, you actually might be able to fight that. You might be able to go into court and say, well, based on what? Based on what parameters is the exhaust too loud? There is some ASE testing, I'm sorry, uh, SAE um, uh, standards that have been put out, but they're very gray, they're not very uh, definite, so you can definitely play in that area. If you want to run straight pipes or something like that, now, you're going to get hassled a lot, you know, you're definitely going to get pulled over if you run straight pipes all the time, but technically speaking, there's no standard that says at this RPM, at this gear, at this speed, at this distance, you know, there's so many different variables that come into play. For example, you know, at what range of a building do you need to be nearby? 
all of these can play a role on the sound of the exhaust system. So you, you can have fun in the catback exhaust area. But headers, catalytic converters, air intakes, you're starting to run into, um, especially being in California, you're starting to run into some red zones where you want to make sure that you have a, an ARB sticker, a California Air Resources Board sticker. Um, they, I should have brought a sample for you, sorry, but they're just a simple little sticker, this big, and you just put them on your front core support and you're fine. Now, one of the most popular questions is, okay, so I buy a turbo kit or a supercharger kit or something like that, and then I want to add more power later on. It's not up to the manufacturer to remove that decal from your vehicle. <laughs> Take that for what it's worth. <laughs> so if you decide that you want to put a supercharger on there and it's all carb legal and ready to roll, that's on you if you want to increase the boost and have a little bit more fun. <laughs> one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is simply because there are a lot of people who don't fully understand how important California Air Resources boards and, and the product uh, staying within that realm is. Uh, a lot of the times lately, they've actually been setting up checkpoints. I don't know if you guys have seen them around here. Um, yeah, a lot of heads nodding. They're setting up checkpoints on the side of the freeway where very much like a sobriety test, you have to pull your car in there, they stick a sensor uh, up the tailpipe, you know, rev the engine a few times, get the emissions testing going, and if you fail, that's a red flag. You're off to the, uh, the inspection area. I personally had a scenario, again, one of my vehicles that was on the, uh, <laughs> a little bit over the gray area. Um, my supercharger kit that was on my Nissan Titan was fully street legal, 100%, no problem. In fact, we have the EO number for it, I can pull it up. Um, and I got pulled over on my way home from work. I was sitting at a stoplight, cop pulls me over, looks at my truck, I rolled down the window because I had just been pulled over two weeks before and I rolled down the window and said, yeah, I'll meet you in that parking lot over there. And so we pulled into the parking lot and he says, oh, you know, your truck's highly modified. I said, mm -hmm, it is, you know, no doubt about it. It was long travel suspension, uh, fiberglass fenders for off-road purposes, um, custom racing seats installed, TVs, all whole nine yards. And he says, pop your hood for me. Damn, I forgot my sticker. So I popped the hood and... Caught me off guard. <laughs> um, pop the hood, and like I say, I forgot the sticker underneath the uh, or for the supercharger. So the cop says, "Do you have a EO for that?" And I said, "Yep, yeah, I do. I can have somebody from the office come bring it for me right now. I simply forgot the sticker. Too bad it's not on the truck. Wrote me a ticket, three hundred and fifty dollar fine, just because I forgot the sticker. But then I had to go over to the emissions test station, which is the uh, smog referee, if you've ever heard of that term, over at." Um, What's the other college? Uh, uh, Coast. Coast. No, not not OCC. Sorry. I think it's the Tustin. Isn't it? uh, I'm not familiar with the Tustin one. There's another one in like Huntington Beach area. Golden West. West. Golden West. I'm sorry, not Coast. Yeah, Golden West. So Golden West has a small referee station right there, and they literally have two or three referees. In my time, there was three referees climbing over the top of your vehicle, going all the way through your engine bay, your emission systems, all your catalytic converters, make sure everything is what it says it is. And this is on an application where it was actually legal. I walked into the referee and said, here's my EO number, here's everything you need to know about it. And they said, oh sweet, this will be easy for us to walk through then. And it took me two hours to simply go through and have this all checked out. And I was sitting next to another guy who was waiting for his vehicle to be inspected next because he had a Honda that had he had done an engine swap on and he said, oh yeah, it's real easy. It only takes me about four or five hours to do the engine swap back and forth. And I said, oh, okay, well, how many times do you have to do that? Oh, this is probably my fifth or sixth time getting refereed. <laughs> okay, I don't care how easy that is, but five or six times and a few hundred bucks each time, that's not worth it to me. So it's just good to know, you know what you can and can't do. Um, for example, some aftermarket turbo kits are very, very easy to get through carb. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is like the rear mounted turbo kits. One of the reasons why that's easy is because your catalytic converters and all your emissions systems and everything else are way up front. You're really not getting into that with a rear mounted turbo kit. Um, some of the ones that are more complicated are, are a proper uh, turbo kit where the turbos are right up by the manifolds. Um, the biggest thing is, is you have to fire your catalytic converters. You have to get them up to temperature in less than 60 seconds. So now all of a sudden your turbo becomes a big heat sink. You can't get that heat into the catalytic converter, so you're not going to pass that 60 second startup. That's the very first test that they do, and no aftermarket manufacturer will get their turbo kit through that test. Um, the alternative is you put your catalytic converter in front of your turbo. 
now you've got a blockage in front of your turbo, it affects your performance, efficiency, yada, yada, yada. It's not as optimal of a design. Um, superchargers are generally a little bit easier to get through uh, California Air Resources Board testing. But um, the other thing too that it kind of helps you guys as consumers know is how serious that manufacturer is about their product. Uh, we just got a supercharger through um, actually our I just got the new ones extended to, I think the EO number is dash 20. Yep. So this application right here is one that we got through testing just recently. You can see that we've already got a uh, card certification for the 2014 Infiniti Q50 and some of the 2014 models. Um, that took us about a year to get through the carb testing and we estimate a little over $100,000 invested in getting that up there. Um, so what that basically translates to, to the end user, to the consumer, is it's a well-engineered, well-thought-out, um, heavily invested product. It's not something that you know companies just throwing together, making it fit, and then getting it out the door. It's something that a lot of work has gone into and a lot of development. Um, so that kind of goes over emission systems as far as what you can and can't do. Um, you know, as I say, catalytic or sorry, catback exhaust systems, anything post sensor, you're fine. So O2 sensors, basically anything behind those, you're perfectly fine. You really can do whatever you want. Um, anything pre-sensor, you're getting into an area where you need some sort of an EO number or something along those lines. Um, again, you can do whatever you want, but this is just a simple way to get out of any hassles or headaches or anything that you might experience. Uh, I was driving home the other night and I actually saw a guy on the side of the road and his hood was open and it was an older 240 and cop was going right through his car. Some people got some 240s in here. <laughs> there you go. How legal is that too? We'll turn the camera off if you like. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Well, then, yeah, you, you probably get some good money for that one day. Keep that investment around. But, um, yeah, the 240 is one of the most heavily modified cars. Now, a cool thing that you can do, though, with a 240 is you can take a GM crate motor. Right? And that's a very uh, common swap, is doing an LS swap on those cars. You could take a GM crate motor, stick it into the 240, because GM has their, uh, I forget what they're called, but it's like their E-series, something like that, or green series, somewhere along those lines. And that is a fully uh, carb legal, you can put that package into any vehicle that you want, and it's been approved for emission systems. So it has all the standard emission control systems, everything you want to do, and you can have a V8 GM motor in any vehicle that you want and be fully compliant. So there are options for you if you do want to look at motor swaps and things like that. Um, you can get creative and still be compliant. The, the biggest thing with that, um, the, the rule is, is very simple. If you have a, an LS motor, all you have to do is have all of the emission systems that came with that motor in that vehicle. So you can do a Fox body Mustang with a GM motor, no problem, you can do it all the time. Um, 2015 Mustang, if you wanted to do that for some reason, you can put an LS motor in there as long as you carry over the uh, emission systems. You can show all your uh, information to the police officer, nothing he can do about it, except for give you a thumbs up and let you go down the street. So, any questions on emission systems or anything? The smog checkpoints, can't you just tell them no? Um, you can but very similar to a DUI checkpoint or anything like that, you are telling someone who, generally speaking, has very high feelings of his authority, <laughs> and you are asking for more headaches than it's worth, quite honestly, uh, unless you have something with your vehicle. But with that being said, they'll get you. I mean, they'll let you drive down the street, and then they'll pull you over for something else and impound the vehicle for whatever reason. You know, we, we've, unfortunately, we've seen some very creative things, but, yes? So what happens if you hit one of those checkpoints in pre-75, do they just have to wait you through or can they actually give you a hard time? No, I mean, they really can't touch you because at that point, I mean, I've seen guys, the, the old rumor is that Robbie Gordon built his trophy truck off of a pre-75 vehicle and left about that much of the chassis in there with a VIN number. <laughs> the rest of it was tube chassis and everything else and said, ha, can't get me. <laughs> so yeah, if it's a pre-75, have fun. You can do what you want. Is it 75 or 74? Is it 75? Okay. All right. So yeah, pre-75, you can do whatever you like. <laughs>
So, so you're saying that, say if you had an intake, even if it was carb legal, but if you don't have the sticker on it, when they ask you to pop your hood, you still get a ticket for it? What they call that is an illegal intake modification. Um, it's not a specific code, it's not a, it, I'm sorry, it is a specific code, but it's not a specific description. But that basically just says, this is not a part of the factory vehicle, go get it tested. Um, and when I had it done, I had my test done in 2005, so nine years ago, um, and it was $350 then. The fines in California have not gone down, so I only imagine it's probably closer to four or $500 by now. Um, so yeah, it's, <laughs> It's not a cheap date for sure. Yeah. Okay, so that sticker is really important. This sticker is very important. Yeah. Does anyone have an aftermarket intake on their car right now? We we already asked that. What's a brand name? Throw a brand name at me. Racing B. Racing B. They might not have. They do. Do they? Okay. <laughs> I haven't actually done it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I I'd, I'd ask for it. But Tell me. There you go. <laughs> What's another name? Yeah. yeah it's like H A. K and N. K and N. K and N. Yep. Uh, what series intake is it? Uh, it's the only one they make for the. Or it's the first series for the RX-8. Typhoon. Okay. More. So it's an FIPK. It, it's either a Typhoon or an FIPK. They they have a 57 series, a 69 series. Oh, just kidding. I don't remember why I said H. It's HKS. Oh, HKS. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They typically operate in the gray area. You might have you might have cars. Um, I haven't checked for a sticker actually. So I don't know. Yeah. It was on the car when I bought it. Okay. Um, well, you probably would have had to have done an emissions test then in order for them to re-register the vehicle yeah. to another person. Yeah. So yeah, more than likely you're safe. Um, but yeah, it's it's good to know um, and get that sticker if you can. Okay. The, the biggest ones to look at, the reason why I bring up K&N and the 57 series, 69 series, 77 series, and all the different series that they have, is K&N makes it very easy to follow, actually. Um, and different manufacturers will do this for you. There's actually codes in their part numbers. So for example, all 57 series intakes from K&N are carb legal. That's their, kind of their giveaway. Um, just to kind of give you an example as to how serious the carb uh, regulations are, we're a company who, uh, we sell all over the world at Stillen. We have customers in Australia, New Zealand, um, Dubai, uh, all over Asia, Europe, all over the place. We cannot buy an intake from uh, K&N if it's not carb approved. They won't ship it to us. We had a customer in Puerto Rico and we said, okay, let us ship it to them. And this is a, this is a large um, dealer account that we continually sell product to. And we said, they're in Puerto Rico. They don't have the same emission standards that we have in California or even in the U.S. You ship it to Puerto Rico for us on our behalf and no problem. And they said, no, because you are a California entity, we will not ship it for you. Mm -hmm. So they won't even ship a non-carb approved intake to a company or on the behalf of a company in California outside of the state, outside of the country. They won't do it. It's, it's getting to be more and more serious. Um, last year at SEMA show, basically um, what a lot of companies used to do to operate in that gray area is they would sell product under a racing use only uh, title. And basically, you know, people would say, oh, well, these high flow catalytic converters are really only intended to be used on the racetrack and we're not responsible if you use them on the street. Well, the state of California came in and said, yeah, there's no such thing anymore. You cannot sell anything that's for intended for off-road use only uh, in the state of California. If it's only if it's intended for off-road use only, then you know just don't even try and get it in, into the state. MagnaFlow uh, exhaust systems. They're also a separate division of their business is um, catalytic converter manufacturing. They're one of the largest catalytic uh, converter manufacturers out there for the aftermarket industry. They uh, made all of their resellers sign a big disclaimer saying that we would not knowingly sell or distribute a, a high flow catalytic converter in the state of California. Um, so it's, it's a pretty significant thing within the industry um, and it's getting some, some uh, knowledge out there to, to the general consumers, but unfortunately not enough in our opinion. So, any other questions on emission? Yep. Well, what seems to What's like the reason that California is so strict on emissions compared to? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a couple different things. Um, you know, it's definitely 
there's more revenue for them to be testing regularly and making that a part of it. Um, the other thing too is we are a uh, we're a state run by um, activists, and there's a lot of greeny activists who are all about not polluting and everything. Which hey, don't get me wrong, I'm all about not polluting. You know what I mean? I, all my vehicles. Well, no. <laughs> even aside from that, I mean, you know, all of our parts. We we spend a lot of money. We work very hard to make sure that our products are um, carb legal and, and not doing any sort of damage. Um, which you know, if you ask anyone who um, is in their 50s or 60s and they grew up in LA, they'll tell you that 30, 40 years ago they couldn't walk outside some days because the smog was so bad and it would hurt their lungs so badly. Um, and whereas today, you know, sure we get smog, but that's been around for a hundred years. That's not as bad as it was back then. So it is primarily a, a, an EPA thing, just an environmental protection going on. But um, they're a government agency. There's some money back there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Yep. Yeah. Um, so if I get pulled over for like a speeding ticket mm -hmm. or something, uh, do they have the right to pop my hood? Um, there's a couple, again, that's a bit of a gray area. Um, if you say no, you refuse to do it, yeah. then they'll say, okay, that's fine. Let me go get a warrant. Just hang out here for me by the side of the road while I go get a warrant. Because technically they cannot search your vehicle without a warrant. You can say no to, to the, the DUI test or the breath of or the, uh, the sniffers or whatever. And then they'll just ask you to wait there while you go, to, go get a warrant. And you're not really getting out of that. Um, so it, the, the, the rule of thumb that we always use is don't do two things wrong at once, you know? <laughs> Again, going back to my Titan, this was a big red flag and I lived in Irvine. So, I mean, it was doing like seven things wrong at once. <laughs> and so, I, I, like I say, the two times that I got pulled over in that truck, I was sitting at stoplights and I wasn't even driving. And the second time I asked the cop, can you give me a speeding ticket or something? Like, make it worth it a little bit. And um, they'll, they'll if you're speeding and they think that there's something going on and they ask you to pop your head, they, you know, you can fight it and you can tell them no, but they'll win. You know, it's, it's best not to poke the bear. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. Um, with new cars, like the G500 that has, it looks like an aftermarket intake. Mm -hmm. What if the officer, I mean, doesn't know if those cars come like that and they try to get a ticket for that? You just have to go to the hospital point of the referee and no, um, there's a couple of different things on that. Uh, number one, you can just simply explain to them that's a stock intake and they can go and, I mean, they've all got 17 inch laptops in their computers these days. They can go and look it up and see very quickly that it is a stock intake. Um, but for the most part, they, they'll have actually a, a emissions control system on there. Um, a lot of the times they have an EVAP system control. Um, so the GT500 is a good example because it does look highly modified. Uh, Z. Z. <laughs> somebody have one of these? Yeah. These things are awesome. So, what you can't see... Yeah, you can't see it. So you can see the on that. Right around here. They have them here, and they also have, on the GT500, I think they have them like right around this area, too. I think it's, on the it's in the middle. Just, I think it's right around here. Where's the jet? Where's the stand? Do you know where it is on your car? I'm sorry. The car number. I think it's on the. The car number. No, you're talking about the the EO number or the or like the emissions. A lot of the times on vehicles like these, they actually have a diagram of the emission system. Um, I don't, I don't know where it is on the GT500. Yeah, the sticker and there's the lines in the back. Yeah, it shows the hoses. And, like it'll show everything on the diagram. Um, so yeah, if you have one of those cars, you'd probably pay just to take a look and see where that diagram is. But I know I've seen them. I know I've seen them on the GT500s. We're working on a Raptor right now that uh, we're putting a supercharger on that. And I know uh, I've seen them on there too. So Ford's usually pretty good about the emissions diagrams. So that kind of covers um, the emission systems. If nobody has any other questions about emissions controls or what you can and can't do, um, 
Some of the other modifications, oh, I'm sorry. Does this like include new camshafts? Uh, yeah. Forge, bottom ends, and Yeah, everything. Pretty much, like, now, there are camshafts that are carb lead. Um, unless you have a crazy cam on there that's sitting there loping at the light, <laughs> most people won't notice. Um, but for example, one of the things that got Ford in trouble with the new, uh, sorry? He has camps. Oh, okay. It sounds stuck though. See that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a, you have a Mustang I'm guessing? Uh, no, a Corvette. A Corvette. Okay. Very nice. Um, there was a Mustang. I can't remember which one. It's the, uh, not the GT500. It just came out in like 13 or 12. And uh, there you go. And it's got the red key. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. That red key held Ford back from releasing the car um, for six months six or a months. year. Yeah. Was it six months? Six yeah. Months. Because they couldn't get through car with that red key. And yeah. again, they went to, to California and they said, well, the red key is only designed to be used on the racetrack. And Carp said, yeah, right. Because you're going to guide every single owner of that car and make sure they don't use the red car, or the red key on the street. I'd only run the red key if it was my car. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that held them back for six months. And, and one of the big things is the cam timing on that. It gets very aggressive. And it basically sounds like you've got a big old cam in that, and it's awesome. But um, yeah, it, it can be... Cams are one of those areas where if you go to, to a test station, will anyone find it? Probably not. You probably won't have an issue with it. Um, but technically speaking, could it alter the emissions of the car? Yeah, absolutely. They can absolutely alter the emissions output. Um, it can, they can also not be seen. You know, six one way, half dozen the other on some of them, depending on how aggressive the cam is. If it's pretty mild, you might get away with it. Yeah, it's pretty mild. <laughs> also does yeah most cops these days that I've seen are just going straight to to the hard line um, there's been a big push for a long time and, and California has been very successful with this about getting rid of street racing and they really see street racing with aftermarket parts and that's kind of where their uh, what their end goal is um, so with that being said, you know, we talked a little bit about how California is obviously uh, in some of their doing a lot of this testing, a lot of these things for the financial benefit of it. Um, with that being said, this whole California Air Resources Board system is free to any manufacturer. So it doesn't cost us anything to go to California and say we want to get part XYZ tested. There's no cost to that. The cost is in the laboratories and in the time and the uh, engineering and everything invested in it beyond that point. So California does work for us, for all of us, um, to ensure that you know they're not charging for, for these tests and for this process, um, but they do charge, but there's extensive uh, costs involved with the lab testing and everything else. So, yep. So back to the cam, if you're um, kind of stuff like it's loping, mm -hmm. the officer pulls you over, um, gives you a referee ticket, you have to go to the referee station and you open up your entire engine? That's a good question. I don't know about a cam. I haven't had to experience a cam yet. Mm -hmm. um, That'd be pretty ridiculous. I, they can be. Yeah, they can be pretty ridiculous. <clears throat> they don't, I mean, there are very few things that government agencies take um, more severe than emissions at this point. Just to give you guys an example, and this is off topic of California, but New Zealand um, actually entered into something called the, uh, I think it was called the Kyoto Agreement. Okay. Yeah. Have you guys heard about this, what the emissions systems? Yeah. And basically what happened is they were supposed to calculate their general carbon footprint for the whole country. And any country could get involved in this Kyoto Agreement, which would basically measure all of the, the, the carbon footprint for the whole the whole country and all the people in it. Well, New Zealand forgot to count the sheep and cows when they were doing their initial study. No joke, they forgot to count the, the, the cows and sheep and everything within the country. And There was a study done a few years ago where there's 10 sheep to every person in New Zealand. So that's a huge miscalculation. And they didn't count 
there's, there's a woman in here, so please forgive me. They didn't count them farting. So that actually hurt their, they got fined huge amounts of money because of the emissions coming out of the cows and sheep. So, I mean, this is how severe the governments are looking at emissions output and everything else that goes on with it. So I wouldn't put it past them to tear down an engine in order to take a look at the cam. Is it likely? No. You know, I'd say it's probably a 10% chance that it's actually going to happen, but it's possible. You know, if they want to do it, they can do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think. Too much time, too much money. It's not worth it to me. I'd rather just stick a blower on it and have fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So even if it's so even if you have like a, an upgraded intake from the factory, say like an F Sport or a BMW performance intake, you would still have to have a carb sticker on it. Generally speaking, like a TRD, for yeah. example, is already going to come carb approved. Um, we actually do some manufacturing for TRD as well. And um, so if you go to, and they're really annoying with the way that they do this. They've got, I don't know how, who came up with this idea, but it was an intake and exhaust system. Um, and then down here further, they have a different version for intake. Oh, air cleaner modification, air filter intake wow. modification. It's like, it's really confusing. So let's hope I got it right the first time here. Um, okay. So, yeah, I didn't. I saw that list that there was a nitrous listed. Yep, you can get nitrous approved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, it's actually interesting. Um, just on a side note while I look for this, the, the carb test is actually an interesting concept. Basically what happened is um, they hired, the state of California, the Air Resources Board hired a new engineer and they went to the engineer and they said, okay, your job is to drive home, or is to um, create our test pattern. So what we have to do, everyone here is familiar with a, with a dynamometer, a dyno, yeah? So basically, whenever we get a car tested, we take it down to a dyno. It's a, obviously much fancier than just a dyno, but that's effectively what it is. Uh, we put the car up on the dyno and we drive through a drive cycle. So they basically simulate um, a driving pattern of low RPM, just cruising from light to light, going up a slight grade, things like that, cruising at about 50 or 60 miles an hour, that sort of thing. Um, so what I found out is that they basically went to this engineer and they said, okay, your job is to come up with this drive cycle. So he said, okay, he drove home. He hooked up all the testing equipment and everything and all the data loggers and he just simply drove home. He said, okay, here's an average drive. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's interesting that, you know, I mean, it's 100% true because our average drive is an average drive cycle, so no problem. <laughs> and, um, and that's basically how they came up with the drive cycle that we all have to go through for our test procedures. Um, geez, this one company has a lot of part or a lot of vehicles under this one EO number. Um, but yeah, so with a nitrous system, um, the reason why it might be oh ADM, um, the reason why it might be approved for something like that is because on an average drive home, this guy never went full throttle. So it really, so here you go, F-Sport. That was lucky, I landed right on it. <clears throat> so F-Sport um, has it, now is that F-Sport? Yeah, TRD subsidiary. So yeah, for, for this there would be a, a carb number. Yeah, you see Ford Motor Company, Special Vehicle Operations, AKA Ford Racing, so Actually, this is most likely the intake that's on the GT500. There you go, Shelby, Shelby GT500. Cold yeah. And so the Shelby GT500 cold air upgrade kit includes an open element, high flow conical air filter, and a new mass airflow sensor tube. So this will be similar to the stock one that's on there. Um, and there's probably a slightly different one for the stock one, but that'll be an upgrade path or whatever. So the OEs do. Whenever the OEs uh, do any sort of aftermarket parts, I shouldn't say whenever, there's a couple that don't do it, but mm -hmm. generally speaking, they'll, they'll do an uh, EO number as well. Okay. But there still has to be like a number somewhere on the part. Yeah. Um, the, 
Well, it's not on the part. <clears throat> so where it is. It's simply a sticker that you put on your front course port. So this particular one's an AEM. So it just says CARB D392-28. Um, and that just needs to be on the vehicle somewhere. So this is an example of one over on the side. So K and N put theirs on the parts a lot of times. Um, some supercharger companies will put them on the blower themselves. It's, it's, we have to submit that where we're going to put it. Uh, when, when we have to submit where we're going to put it and also what it's going to look like when we go for our um, our test letters. Uh, but it's fairly standard either on the part or on the course of board. Okay, but like, so just somewhere it has to show that. Correct. Got it. Yeah, and you want you want to put it somewhere where it's not going to get damaged. You know, if you pop the hood and it's like, well, that's where the sticker used to be. <laughs> Strut yep. tower. Right. Yeah. That's a good spot for it too. Yep. So um, on, the, on that sticker that you're talking about, does it have a part number on there? Um, it, it, I think it does. Because well, I have it's, um, it's DC Sport headers for my Civic. Right. And it came with a sticker and then it has like the part number on it and it says it's completely legal. So if, anybody, if a cop asks, I just show them that sticker and it's legal. So it has a number right on it. So what they do is they they don't all do it, um, and it just depends on the age of the part. Um, for example, you know the AEM one here. There's no part number; it's just the EO number. Um, but that EO number will take you back to a page like this. Right, did I close it? Oops. Well, this will work. Where you type in the EO number, and then all the uh, applicable um, or all the applications that it fits will pop up right there. Um, the recent changes that they've made, and this might be if you have a recent DC Sports part, um, is now they do mandate that the part number is on the the decal as well. So going back to that laundry list of applications that we have under the one EO number, we have to have all of those listed on the on the decal. Do you think the officer? Also, that actually checks the number with the part number? Um, well, there's no part number on the part um, in a lot of cases. So at that point, it's kind of how, you know, what you do to piss him off that much that he's going <laughs> to go through that much uh, detail. So hypothetically speaking, you could put on any sticker? <laughs> I was going to ask. Uh, hypothetically speaking, yes. Uh, again, as a manufacturer, I'm not responsible for what you choose to do. Uh, but yeah, if you if you did that, that would be on you. Yeah. Probably do it. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, so sorry, getting back to the nitrous thing, um, because they don't do wide open throttle during the testing procedures, um, depending on how you have your nitrous kit set up, you might, if you only have it set for wide open throttle, then you might be able to, to get it through carbon. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's not doing anything, you know, so it doesn't affect anything. Anything else on emissions? Yep. Yeah. Um, can smog dyes tell if you have an aftermarket tune in your car? So that's a very good question. Um, the theory is, and no one's really. I I know a lot of small guys actually. Um, and I've asked them that as well. And they have told me it depends on the tune and depends on the car. The theory is, at least what they've told me, and they're small guys, so they don't want, they, they have to be very, very careful. You know, it used to be 10 years ago, you could know a guy who would yeah. patch it through and be fine. Sure. These days, they don't want to take that risk. Um, actually, just to um, jump off topic real quick, if somebody came into Stillen and said, I want you to install this intake, um, that's not carb approved, we're running the risk of a $10,000 fine per instance. And not just per instance that they can prove, per instance that they think you've done. So for example, if we might have only done it once or twice, but if they come in and say, yeah, but you know, that's on average, you probably do this five times a year. We're gonna hit you for 50 grand. Good luck fighting it. You're not gonna win that, you know? So that we don't even do it. We don't mess with that. Um, but getting back to what you were talking about, Ford um, has said that they know if certain tuners have been inside their ECUs because it leaves a ghost trail and they can tell. Um, 
Whether or not a smog shop has that level of sophistication that they can see it, I don't know. I'd be surprised if they could. Um, but, you know, I, I just don't know that answer. Yep. I'll kind of just play on that. Um, like you said, most uh, computers, they have a clock, or I'm not, a clock pattern, mm -hmm. clock click, yeah, which ticks over every time you do flash it. But uh, I know for the for Mustangs, at least, the dealership can't talk with that, but they send the uh, ECU or the PCM. Right. They send it off to some different location where they can actually charge one of the big things that Ford had a, a problem with was um, back when the turbo diesels really became a big thing in um, 2003, right around there. Uh, have you guys ever heard of Roland Cole? Yeah, everyone's seen the YouTube videos on that. Pretty funny. Well, that what all happened there is basically you. There's controllers that you can get where you could bump it all the way to stage five and have like 250 pounds of torque and 110 horsepower. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's a lot of fun in a big old full-size truck to have that much power and torque. And then you can also go to your next menu and increase your uh, the smoke that comes out of the exhaust system. <laughs> and I mean, there's guys, you could fill up the inside of a Prius pretty good. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> So, I mean, these things are a lot of, you know, they, they could be fun to roll coal or whatever. Um, but Ford had a problem where people were just cranking these things up. I actually had a friend of mine who only used his truck for drag racing, but he figured out that you could stack the tuners. So he could get, it, it's, I don't know how it works. I'll be the first person to admit, I don't know how this works, but apparently you can get a bully dog tuner and a Banks tuner and an edge tuner and stack them and you get like triple the amount of power that you would normally get. It only works on diesels as far as I've been told. And I mean, it, I've seen it work, it does work. This guy, I watched him do progressively faster times doing this. Um, but in doing it, he was cranking the boost on the engine to some obscene number and blowing the head studs right off of the thing. So then he, or blowing the head gaskets out, I'm sorry. So then he would take it into Ford and say, hey, my head gaskets blew up. Um, can you warranty this for me? Because it was a six month old truck. Well, how are they gonna prove otherwise? So that's when they started announcing that they actually can prove otherwise and that they can go into the ECU and see how many times it's been flashed. Um, another example is the GTR, the Nissan. You know, a lot of, you can easily see what someone's done or Nissan can easily see what someone's done to that GTR. It actually has a, a memory to it. So it'll record, it's constantly recording what you're doing and data logging everything that you're doing. So if all of a sudden you've got a blown engine and you've only got a minute and a half of life on the ECU, chances are you erased your ECU and you actually did something beforehand that you're not you know, being upfront about. So there are ways around that that, they, that the OEs know about. Anything else on emissions? Harry? No, is that to be against going aftermarket, or is it just the fact that they just want people to stop blowing for cars? Um, they won't give any free parts. Yeah, it, it's warranty. basically just warranty. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, we all have to be responsible for what we do. And um, it's not fair to the OEs to go out there. And for example, getting back to the GTR, the, the whole story about the GTR transmission. Right, everyone's heard about the GTR transmission. Oh, it's too weak and everything else. Well, what you didn't hear about is the first guy that actually blew up his transmission in a GTR. Again, getting back to the data logger, he did 18 launches in a matter of like three and a half minutes. <laughs> that's what you don't hear. You know, I mean, and that's you, all you hear is some guy going on the news and everywhere else talking about the GTR transmission. Well, Nissan didn't want to give a bad light on anything, and they didn't want to make this guy look bad. So they just said, okay, here's a new transmission, and they just ate it. But in reality, the guy was driving like an animal, and Nissan really shouldn't be responsible for that. Um, so ultimately, yeah, they're just trying to kind of mitigate their losses a little bit and, uh, and make sure that they're not just buying everyone a new vehicle when there's actually nothing wrong with the vehicle that they built. That said, though, GTR, your GTR owner's manual, in the middle of the manual, has a page mm -hmm. where they enter the serial number of each replaced transmission. It's in the owner's manual. Right. Then also the I was talking to a guy who owned one, and if you launch, use your launch nowadays. If you buy one, use your launch control. Period. 
they will void your warranty right. on, or on a lot of, I don't know if they void it on everything, but on certain items, they will void the warranty if you, you even use launch control once. My understanding is that it's on the transmission only. And with that being said, I think that, just from what I think, or in what I've heard in talking with people at Nissan directly, is that that's actually kind of been blown a little bit out of proportion that you don't necessarily lose your warranty. Um, it's just, it limits some of the things. Um, I'll tell you, we have a GTR rally car that we race down in rally races in New Zealand. There was a guy who basically has made a living talking bad about the GTR transmission and they had three uh, GTRs in the rally. They went through four transmissions on the rally. One of the cars went through one of the cars went through three. One of the cars, actually, no, they went through more than four transmissions because one car went through three of them. One car went through two of them, and another car went through one of them. We we are on a bone stock transmission. We've done three rallies. We've never had a problem with our transmission. So the stock transmission on the GTR is perfectly fine. Um, it, you know, there's nothing really wrong with it. It just depends on how hard you drive, and you know, you can give me a Hummer, I'll break it. You know, it, 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 there's ways to break anything if you try hard enough. Anything else on emissions? Yeah, or GTRs? The RST, they do know when you flash it. If, if you drive it into a dealer, I don't know Audi, uh, once they plug it in, they, they tell whether or not you flash it or not. Typically, it's supposed to flash, you're supposed to take it to your dealer and install the tune and flash it out before you take it into the dealer. But if you drive it into the dealer and you flash it to the market as T1 for Audis, okay. which will not void your warranty, but will be harder to replace parts on your Audi because okay. they're going to prove what you did wrong or what was causing the, the tune to fail or the car to fail. It's a good thing that you bring up tuning and taking the car to the dealership because there's a couple of different things that we should go over on that. Um, the first one, yeah, it sounds like, you know, especially if you do a tune, there's probably ways that they can go in there and see that something's different than stock, uh, especially on the more advanced cars like Audis, BMWs, Mercedes, things like that. Fords and GMs aren't quite as sophisticated as the Audis uh, and BMWs are. Um, but the other thing to take note of is if you have an aftermarket tune on your car or you have a, a supercharger or anything like that on your car, Make sure that the factory or that the dealership does not flash your ECU, because like you just touched on, you're supposed to remove the, the tune and then do any updates and then put the tune back in. The reason you want to do that is because you paid for the license, you paid for that tune. If they just were to overwrite the ECU, you lose it. It crushes that that tune and it's gone. So we have a customer, for example, we had a, a gentleman who lived in San Diego with one of our 370Z superchargers. And he called us up and said, hey, my car doesn't run right. I just got my oil change done. And we said, well, what do you mean your car doesn't run right? Oh, it just, it's barely running. Well, he went from, I forget what size injectors the factory injectors are on the 370Z, but I think they're about, call it 350cc fuel injector to a 600cc fuel injector. So that's basically take a half inch hose to a one inch hose. Now, all of a sudden, his tune, which is optimized for the 600cc injector, now the car thinks it has a 350 cc injector so you're basically flooding that cylinder with fuel because it's just cranking in as much fuel as it would need so that ecu was right back down to stock so he lost all of the performance benefits all of the uh, really everything and we had to ship him down next day air him down a new cable new tune new everything so that he could just drive the car again because it thought it was stock and had stock injectors so it's, it's a very good point that you bring up to make sure that you remove the tune or protect it in some way. You can actually buy on eBay and Amazon, you can buy a little cover for your OD2 port that just simply says, do not remove this uh, without consulting the owner. And I think they're like a buck fifty or something like that. It's worth it. Anything else on emissions or tuning or anything? No? One of the great things about living in the U.S. is we're one of the few countries that doesn't get into um, really testing the rest of the vehicle, suspension, uh, brakes, bodywork, anything like that. So that's kind of where you can have a lot of fun. Um, in New Zealand, uh, for example, every six months you have to put your car up onto a machine and it tests your brakes, it tests your tires, they test everything, your, your suspension, the whole nine yards. Um, we don't really have that here. So from an exterior standpoint, you can have fun. You can do pretty much whatever you want to do. 
Um, don't mess with airbags. That's a big <laughs> fine. Don't want to find out that I did. Um, you know, th those sorts of safety things you don't really want to mess with, seat belts, airbags, anything along those lines. Um, but I mean, exterior wise, there's regulations on like the height of a truck, but only in relation to the headlights. The headlights are only a certain, are only allowed to be a certain height. Uh, same thing with uh, how low a vehicle can be. It's all based on the headlight um, and, and bumpers and things like that. But again, I'm sorry? License plate heights. License plate heights are one. Uh, I know people have gotten caught because they're, so like for example, on uh, uh, old Integras where license plates are mounted. It's right down at the bottom. And then so the license plate is too low when you slam the car. Right. And, and that's a fix a ticket. Now, have they gotten it for license plate or damaging the license plate? So they got it for the license plate being basically illegally installed license plate. So they didn't get they didn't get them on the car being lowered. The Just technicality they used was low. that the license plate is illegally mounted. Okay. I've heard something similar, but with the headlights. Yeah, the headlights is always what I've gone off of. Is, is the headlights and tail lights being at a certain uh, height? Um, the license plate's the only thing I've heard is that technically none of us own the license plate. The license plate is the property of the, of the uh, state of California. So if you drag it on the ground or whatever, you're damaging state property. That's the only thing that I've ever heard. They'll get you for anything they can. On dash, for example, that's not too high? No, you have to have it affixed to the outside of the vehicle. So yeah, you can't have it in, on your dash, you can't have it in the back window. I've been pulled over for both of those. And, yeah. Generally speaking, the cops pretty cool about those ones. You know, you can hey, don't do that. Put it on the back bumper. But yeah. again, it just depends on what you did before you got pulled over to make the cop that mad. So, but yeah, I mean, as far as like wings, front lip spoilers, things like that, you can essentially drag them on the ground as long as your headlights and, and license plates um, are at certain um, certain levels. And then you don't want to mess with anything airbag related, steering wheels that have different airbags, things like that. That's a big fine. The, uh, you guys all, we've all seen uh, Pit My Ride. Did you all hear about the fines that West Coast Customs had for putting TVs where airbags were and all that? Yeah. I've never really wondered why anyone would want a projectile TV at their face yeah. and airbag them out, but that's on me. So. But yeah, okay. Yep. What about, um, what do you know about racing seats and harnesses? So, there's a, it's a good thing to bring up because harnesses are something that I take very seriously. Really anything safety related I take very seriously when a customer comes in and says, hey, I want to put racing seats in and harnesses and a roll cage and everything else. To me, don't run a roll cage if you don't run a helmet. Uh, you are exposing your head, which is a quite a vital part to you living, to steel tube inches away from your head. Not a good suggestion. Um, even in a fully built, proper truck. Um, you guys know who Reese Millen is? The drifter and rally guy? That's my cousin. He um, broke his neck doing a, a backflip in a truck a few years ago. And they basically mounted, this is a tube chassis truck. Um, do you guys remember when they did the New Year's No Limit thing and he was going to backflip it? Maybe not. Well, he landed on his roof and the roof caved in and hit his head and broke his neck. So, I mean, this is even in a purpose-built environment with cage, six-point harnesses, the whole nine yards, and it can happen to you. Um, so that's kind of a general rule of thumb. If you're going to run a, a roll cage, don't do it without a helmet. It's just not a good idea. You can't run a helmet on the street either. So it kind of goes together on that one. As far as uh, harnesses and, and uh, things like that, there's different rules on that, but from everything that I've read, you actually aren't really supposed to run a six-point harness or an anti-submarine device or anything like that on the street. You're really just supposed to do the shoulder and lap belt. Um, and same thing with, uh, with any other sort of braces and things like that or seats. But a lot of it has to do with the age of the vehicle. So like, uh, what year car do you have? Uh, 2000. 2000? Yeah, it's newer. Um, you're starting to get into a little bit of a slippery area. I'm working on a project right now uh, with an OE manufacturer and uh, they wanted us to install racing seats and harnesses and we just told them no, well, we're not going to do that. It's too much uh, liability um, if anything were to happen, you know, it's not okay for us. So. Uh, but again, it's, you know, 
we all take certain risks. It's all of our choices. Um, you won't have too much issue as far as legality goes on that. And, you know, you're not going to go to an emissions test station and they're going to say, "Hey, I can't test you because of your seatbelts." Um, so that that is just kind of run at your own risk. But yeah, I, I highly advise if anyone wants to put a roll cage in their car, don't do it unless you're going to the, to the track, like nonstop. <laughs> so. The other thing too with seatbelts is you want to make sure that all your mounting points are correct. Um, a lot of the times I see people where they have their seat back uh, just like this and then they, you know, obviously they're sitting here and then you got the two holes in the back of the seat and then the seat belt's down like this into the floorboard. That's completely the wrong way to mount a, a harness. You want it parallel. Um, so, you know, make sure that if you do install harnesses, you're doing it properly. There's instructions on any good manufacturer, Sparco um, or Takata, they all tell you how to do it properly. Well, no other questions or anything. I mean, the, the key is enjoy your cars. You know, I mean, I've been modifying cars for my entire life. I've been very fortunate to be able to make it a profession. Um, and it's it's very, very fun for me. I brought our uh, SEMA car here tonight, um, which is something that, you know, it's hard to say that you're having a bad day when you get to take home a 500 horsepower uh, Infiniti Q50. So, it's, you know, we all have to enjoy what we're doing. And the whole reason that we're modifying our cars is for the enjoyment. Um, so, you know, don't get yourself into a position where you can be hassled for something that uh, you really shouldn't be hassled for um, when there might be an alternative out there that uh, is street legal and not, not a headache for you. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thank you very much.